Put on your big Hollywood sunglasses and light the torch, because it's cellar time. Welcome to the crack cellar, as the prophecy was foretold. I'm T-Spirit Penguin Daniel. And I'm Broadcaster Nichols. And today we are going to preview Doom Eternal, the sequel to the 2016 reboot. Broadcaster Nichols, let me start this preview by asking you a question. What is your favorite Doom? Mm, You know, I would say Doom 2 was probably my favorite till 2016. Well, you know, Doom 2, my heart says Doom 2, but really 2016 (laughs) was my favorite to this mm. day i think and now i'm pretty damn sure this new one's gonna be it mm-hmm. yeah i was about to say based <laughs> off what i've seen is probably this new one but uh i'd say doom reboot 2016 is probably my second favorite and doom 2 is still my favorite i think doom reboot is a better game than doom 2 but doom 2 just came out at a time in my life it, it was all it's all feels with that game. I, I played the fuck out of that game. I played Doom 2 before I played Doom 1, actually. I had Doom 2 on shareware, fucking 3.5 floppy disks. I think there's like 12, 12 floppy disks to install that shit. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, it was, it was just a really, like, the timing of Doom 2 was perfect for me because I was getting super into computers at the time, and that was just such a radical game. And even looking back... It really took the original Doom and just took everything great about it and just improved. It was almost like a perfect version of Doom 1. Yeah, it had an improved color palette, which is what I stood out to me as a kid so much. I was just like, oh, dude. Yeah. Well, the level designs were, were more uh, exotic. There were better bosses, more bosses. Like, I loved the map system watching yourself crawl through like this hell on Mars. It was just really, it just had a really cool vibe. And you're talking about the maps, the pop-up maps. Yeah. Yeah. That had an, like almost the same way the beeper, uh, the radar beep on aliens, you know, Mm -hmm. it's like, you looked at it and you're just like, fuck. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So, uh, this game looks really polished already. When you look at these trailers, the gameplay, isn't it kind of crazy? A lot of these games come out with like day one patches and they get, the game doesn't even get really workable till six months later. You know, like uh, Black Ops 4, as an example, Blackout. Uh, <laughs> Still in need of a major update. <laughs> Rest was of <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think that game was basically broken the first four months it was yeah. out. And... Yeah, um, it was- it's pretty harsh. It, it just looks from this gameplay that we're seeing that it, it looks so smooth the way they show all the action. I didn't see anything weird, no like animation glitches. Of course they're gonna pick they're gonna pick and choose parts to, to make the game look better, but I just got a vibe that this game is already polished and they've given it quite a large berth. Probably, I mean, it's it's probably a mix of two things. One being it's id, and they don't like to fu- uh, just from their past 2016 game. They're not fucking around, you know. They want to keep the train going, the momentum going with these this franchise. And then on the other hand, it's by Bethesda, and Bethesda does have not have any fucking room to fuck <laughs> up anymore. So <laughs> that's a great point. They really don't. <laughs> I think they're still trying to sell Fallout 43 like backpacks for $500 to save their company or something like that. Are you fucking serious? <laughs> Ouch. But it's, it's interesting you brought up the color palette of Doom 2 because that was the first thing I thought when I saw these trailers. It reminded me of the color, like the, the, the upgrade of the color palette from Doom Reboot to Doom Eternal reminded me a lot of the same color palette upgrade from Doom 1 to Doom 2. 
Yeah. It instantly gave me that vibe. And part of it was because it's on Earth. So you have a lot more Earth colors rather than like Mars colors. Yeah. Well, they also have, I forget what they call like the creators or something like that. So it looks like there's going to be a lot more of their architecture mm-hmm. instead of just hellscape, if you call it that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm glad too, because as much as I love crawling through hell and Mars constantly, it's, there's been so many dooms that have the exact same setting. As soon as I realized this game took place on earth, I was kind of like, thank you. I'm glad that there's, there's just a little bit of uniqueness here so that it doesn't feel like I'm just playing another, another day on Mars. So what have you heard about the multiplayer of this game? Uh, you know, I actually haven't seen much, but I'm imagining it's going to be a lot like quake arena or what is it? Quake champions. I think that's what they call it. Hmm. Have you played that? I don't think so. I think that's like the like the current thing they're doing as far as multiplayer. So it'd be interesting to see if they just make like a gimmicky multiplayer that's just going to be for this game, or if they're going to actually continue what they are doing with Quake Champions and make a more high budget AAA version of it. Well, it's interesting because I've heard a rumor, and this is not confirmed. But I heard a rumor they're doing the exact same thing that the Resident Evil 3 remake is doing. They're adding a multiplayer where it's like a, a boss creature versus like four humans. Oh, like a juggernaut mode. Mm-hmm. Seems like it's a trend right now. <laughs> That's funny because it's not. It's a really old idea. That mm-hmm. it's like, fucking Halo's been doing it for a long time. Yeah. Well, I'm sure bell bottoms are going to come back in a few more years anyway, so it's... It's weird how culture recycles itself just as soon as some people forget about it. Just enough people forget for it to come back. And it feels like that's what's happening now with the juggernaut modes. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny. It just all kind of was in circles, doesn't it? What's <laughs> what's next? We're gonna we're gonna like firefight's gonna be the next big thing again. <laughs> Remember when firefight was huge, every game had a firefight mode? <laughs> <laughs> Yep. I'm just waiting for Battle Royale to to fall off the same way. But those uh, Fortnite kids are persistent. Yeah, and, uh, you know, what is it? Epic just uh, put out their numbers. Fortnite's still making billions. So. Oh, for the love of Christ. <laughs> it's not going away anytime <laughs> soon. Billions of dollars. Dude, I remember when Fortnite first came out. It wasn't even a Battle Royale when it first came out, and it t- Tanked. I remember Pete, like the news media just like saying, like, this is the biggest failure in the history of video games and all this shit. And then they're just like, well, we're just going to add this Battle Royale mode and see what happens. <laughs> Holy shit. Talk about a fork in the road. <laughs> Fucking Fortnite. <laughs> Fuck that game. <laughs> so, uh,. One, th- one thing I'm looking at this game for is a 90s vibe and. I kind of got it a little bit from the Doom reboot of 2016, but not as much as I wanted. And I feel like this one is kind of going to go more for the throat on like the 90s theming. And one thing that I think capsulates that perfectly are the sword and the axe that we see in the trailer, especially the axe. It just looks like something out of like Hexen. Yeah, I was just about to say, actually, it looks like some shit from Hexen or uh, what they call it. Um, isn't there another game similar to Hex and like Blood Plus or something like that? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But you didn't get that one. Was more practical though. That one, yeah. There were so many. Any, like, oh man, horror shooters from the early '90s. Such a weird subgenre that doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Those games still have like if you ever like boot them up, have like a even if they are like super old, they have a super, a certain soul to them. Oh, for sure. It's, it's weird. <laughs> yeah, I haven't I haven't played Hexen or Blood since like 94 or 5 or something. And I still remember entire levels. The games stuck in your head back then. It's not like now where there are some games I've played in the last 10 years I couldn't tell you a single thing about anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they all just bleed together. Yeah. Yep. But uh, yeah, it's looking good, you know. The the moon got busted up. What's your theory on the moon getting broken? Yeah, I'm thinking 
the, you know, in the trailer, they show uh, the, the Slayer jump down on this giant beam cannon that's firing towards the Earth. So signifying he's probably trying to stop cat- catastrophe or whatever. So um, I, I imagine that's what they're saying. Destroyed the destroyed the moon. Hmm. But one one can theorize. Interesting. I mean, it looked like it got blasted. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and and you think like that floating space magus castle that you see, that's above Earth. That's the v- very end of the Doom reboot. You think? Yeah, I think that's where you get teleported at the end. Interesting. But so you think this is going to just going to be like immediately starts where Doom reboot left off? No in between. Possibly. Hmm. Who knows? I, I mean, in the trailer, that. they show they show the motherfucker just chilling. He has his helmet off. He's just like, oh, shit, what's going on? And he <laughs> yeah. like, puts his helmet on, grabs a shotgun. And he's like, all right, rock and roll. Let's do this shit. <laughs> <laughs> so he was chilling for a little bit. And I think just based on uh, the the year in the trailer, I think it says 2049. In the game, uh, I think it's like 2140-something. So... Hmm. There's some years have passed. That's interesting. So, so he just set up shop on the space Magus castle and just like raised a family and shit. <laughs> is that what? I, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Ah. No, this is going to be interesting. Then I didn't this realize is, there was a huge time. This is a space version of House on the Prairie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I like but it up here. Demons. <laughs> So do you think that the final boss of the game is going to be in hell, or do you think it's going to be in the middle of that pentagram on the planet? Oh, man. I hope that. Dude, how dope would that be, man? That fucking whole pentagram is just fucking desolate, scourged land, and there's just a gigantic fucking... uh, Maybe it's one of the creators, who knows? Because I think (laughs) creators are on the hell side. So who knows? But some gigantic fucking, maybe that Marauder guy. Because I'm pretty sure that Marauder dude has some backstory. The guy with the axe. He's like known as the Betrayer or something like that. The the dude that pretty much sold man uh, mankind, sold the Slayers downriver. Oh, I he didn't was know supposed that. To, yeah, he was supposed to be chosen as the Slayer or something like that. And he didn't. And the Slayer that you are actually isn't from the realm or whatever where all the other knights are from so this betrayer guy got butthurt and uh, tried to kill you but i forget the guy's name anyways this was a long time ago but some shit Mm. like that but i don't know if that was ever yeah, I really like the uh, the voice acting that we've seen so far, too. It seems like every single character just has a very high-tier voice actor associated yeah. to him. Yeah, the Mara- that was, that's actually why I kept on bringing up the Marauder, his voice actors. He called him a usurper, too. I was just like, what the fuck's that? I, I hope they elaborate on that. <laughs> it's like, this guy, you're invading yeah. Earth, and this guy's trying to stop you guys. You call him a usurper? That's an interesting choice of words. <laughs> it is, and it's one of the many things that makes me think that this is going to be a very heavy story compared to past Dooms. It seems clear that it's going to be the most story-based of all of them. I mean, I didn't play Doom 3. That's the only one that I have a blind spot on. Was that story heavy? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, they did kind of like the Destiny 2 thing where it was all on more tablets and shit like that. Oh. Uh, fucking lame. But it well, was. Yeah. It's still a good game. In yeah. fact, I don't. Did they reboot? 2016 was a reboot. Yeah. So Doom 3 doesn't count anymore. I think Doom 3 was the end of the original trilogy. Yeah, but it was nothing like the first two, which is really weird. It reminded, me of, it reminded me of Halloween. Halloween one and two had Michael Myers and it was just this thing. And then the third one comes out and it ha- it's like about a bunch of crazy people that are like poisoning children with poison Halloween candy and it had nothing to do with Michael Myers. And it kind of reminded me of the movie toys with Robin Williams, but evil. You know what I mean? Like, it's really weird fucking movie. And kind of, I'm always trying to tell people toys is evil enough by itself, man. <laughs> Rewatch that movie and tell me you do not get creeped out. Oh, dude. <laughs> it had a sinister undertone for sure. Uh, 
Yeah. I never show my that movie to my kids ever. <laughs> never. <laughs> There's a lot of great Robin Williams movies you can show them. I think we can keep toys in the closet. <laughs> keep it safe down in the crack cellar where it belongs. Deep. <laughs> That's where we keep the fine wine. <laughs> oh, shit. So, so, yeah, so it's the first Doom on Earth. Uh, we're going to play with green. The color green will re-enter our visual spectrum while playing this game, which will be interesting. It has a we'll very... See. <laughs> it's a very unmistakable 90s vibe so far just from what we've seen you can tell that they're really playing into the old school fans now well yeah i mean in the trailers i don't know if they speed it up or they probably speed it up a little bit but it seems super fast paced mm-hmm. yeah and i don't know that kind of gives me like a what was that game called i am sam or not i am sam that was a movie um uh God damn, it's kind of like Team Fortress graphics, but not. Nah. Oh, uh, Serious Sam? Serious Sam, yeah. It kind of gave me those vibes without fast pace and so many things running at you at once, but, yeah. you know, well, obviously with 2020 graphics. Well, that makes sense because Serious Sam, I think, was supposed to be a spiritual successor to Duke Nukem, which was a very fast first person shooter from the same era as Doom. Man, rest in pepperonis, Duke Nukem. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but, uh, but yeah, so what do you think about the graphics with this game? Because they look like they're... They look fucking amazing. Don't they? Like, it seems like they saw Destiny 2 and they're like, well, let's make it more like that. I just get like a vibe, like they took it as a challenge and up well, their game. A lot of people are theorizing that that's where they're starting to take the Doom franchise is it's going to start slowly going into this more open universe. Who knows what they're going to do with the next few games, but it seems like they're building up this greater universe that they're going to explore eventually. Dude, I would be totally down for a Doom MMO. I would be, yeah. si- sign me up for alpha testing. <laughs> I'm in. <laughs> Hope they just, for, for fuck's sake, just don't, don't be Destiny 2. <laughs> <laughs> God no. <laughs> uh, but the so, graphics are fucking amazing. I if you really slow down the trailer though, because I've seen it like I don't know eight times or something. <laughs> <laughs> when you when you slow it down, you actually can see a couple weird things. Like when he um, takes the uh, sword and he lops that fucking demon in three, and mm-hmm. the head goes falling towards the left side of the screen for you. You can actually just see his jaw go from like kind of whipped out from being cut and all the muscles loosening to just whipping back into place like as a normal model. Hmm. So there's a couple like weird bugs like that I, I picked up on where I'm sure that's where they're, the delay came from. You know, that's where they're kind of getting the polish going. But mm. who knows? I notice that. Good eye. Yeah, so. <sighs> I, it does look polished, but, you know, it, there's never been a Doom game where I feel like it wasn't polished. Even Doom 3, I didn't like it, but it did still feel like what it was, it was polished for what it was, what it was supposed to be. Just I, uh, yeah. I mean, I mean, let me put that out. That's nitpicking, what I yeah. said. That's yeah. extreme nitpicking. And as far, as far as Doom 3 goes, I enjoyed Doom 3. I actually liked it a lot. It just wasn't, you know... A Doom game, really. In no. fact, it, 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 like if you took out the demons and just replaced them with their own proprietary enemy that they were going on, they could have made up. The game could have stood on its own. I didn't really like, care for the flashlight mechanic too much, but that's here nor there. That's that's why I quit playing it. I, I did buy Doom three and I played it for like a, maybe an hour, and that flashlight shit, I was I just was done with it. It sucked. I couldn't get into it. Yeah. But uh, what do you think about the sword and the axe? So do you think that those are just the end weapons and you're only going to get them at the very end of the game? Or do you think you're going to get these weapons early on and be able to use them for a chunk? It's probably going to be a mix. The rather going to be like a super ability that you can activate and you can equip only one. Maybe you get, as you go on through the game, you unlock both of them. Or they're just actual like um, environment mechanics. So, like, during certain matches with enemies or bosses, 
you like that it just it appears or something like that hmm yeah it's interesting i was what i was hoping is that it was like a uh, rpg element and that they give you the sword early and that you like upgrade it over time and That'd make be it good. better yeah i was hoping for something like that but it doesn't seem like this game is going to be very heavy on RPG elements, so it's probably wishful thinking. You never know. You yeah. never know. They could uh, they could do that. I don't know if they're going to give you the axe, though. Is there actually something that showed you no, having the axe? No, I'm just theorizing that you might be able to get it. Because I don't believe that that Marauder is the final boss. So I feel like once you kill him and move on to whoever's after, that you might be able to use that axe, but... I don't know. I could be off on that. It just looked too cool to not let the player use. You know what I mean? When they <laughs> yeah, show it, it's like, true. how can you show us that badass fucking weapon and not let us use it? Yeah, we could at least use it to kill him. You would think so, yeah. But, uh, Skyscraper Demon. What do you think about the Skyscraper Demon? Uh, I guess the Colossal Demon, whatever you want to call him, who looks like straight out of Attack on Titan. What do you think's up with him? Do you think that's the final boss, or do you just think it's just some new type of demon? Well, I'm not quite sure if that's the same one from 2016, or if um, it's one of many that's just like roaming the landscape of Earth now. I'm not quite sure what's going on there. But I thought it was only one. But who knows? Mm-hmm. Yeah, obviously, there. at one point in the trailer, you see like, a giant hand hovering over uh, the Slayer. Like he's going to get grabbed. Yeah. So obviously you're going to fuck with it again. That could be something else. I think there was something on the hand. Now I'm thinking about it. That mm. makes me think it wasn't actually the demon. Interesting. I'm, I'm sure you I'm, I'm sure you fuck with that shit again. The Titans are pretty... They stand out. <laughs> they had a lot of screen time in the trailer. Yeah, yeah, I just I couldn't figure out if they were just a normal enemy or if it was like one and it was a boss or if it was the boss. I don't know. It seems like it's no. probably not going to be the boss based off of what we've seen like, in the past. If hell was a Gantz mission, those are like the 100 point motherfucking monsters, you know, <laughs> yeah. the ones you got to bring out the next for, you know, which I'm pretty sure those knights were if you saw that giant knight thing spearing one of them through the chest. I'm pretty sure that's a giant, like, night Gundam. (laughs) They're over now, the big guns. (laughs) Oh, shit. So, does John Carmack have anything to do with Ide still, or did he leave? Mm, Oh, Carmack? Yeah, he left, right? Yeah, Carmack's gone. I think John Romero's there still, though. Okay. I was pretty sure he left, but I wasn't 100% sure. So... Interesting. Did, was he? Do you know if Carmack had anything to do with the reboot, twenty sixteen? No, no. Okay. I'm pretty sure he's off doing the Oculus thing. Yeah. Well, I know. I knew that's what like what his primary thing was, but I wasn't sure if he was also like moonlighting on these Doom games. So that's interesting. These Doom games are pretty good so far, and they don't have anything to do with the original creator, which kind of goes to show you Carmack. Well, Romero unlike, was the original creator. Well, well, it was both of them, right? Yeah. Yeah. Like okay, so that's a that's and a fair there's, point. They there's have also half a th- the coin. There's also a third guy that never gets credited, and I'm pretty sure he's still there too. Hmm. Making the game. So like as far as if there if if you will, there was a triforce. Okay. Two pieces are still there. Well that that explains it then, because usually when the original creators leave a franchise, it does not bode well. And this is one of those rare occurrences where it's yeah. like, whoa, a reboot that's actually good and arguably better than the originals. So that doesn't happen very often. Yeah. Well, I'm pretty sure if I remember correctly, John Romero and John Carmack fucking hate each other, so mm, <laughs> interesting. <laughs> They do not like each other at all. Yeah. Well, I don't know if you saw the Joe Rogan episode with Carmack. He kind of comes off as a douchebag. I, I could kind of see he, he was trying to hide it quite well, but I could see it. I, I hang out with programmers, especially programmers with huge egos. I know how they are. And he fucking, when I was, <laughs> when I was watching <laughs> that, I just knew I'm like, you are a piece of shit to everyone who works <laughs> under you. And I know it. <laughs> He fit the fucking bill, did he? Mm-hmm. Well, maybe that's why these games are good. Maybe Carmack was a dick, and the other two guys are cool, and 
it just breeds a nice working environment because man, it feels like the gaming industry has a real problem with the aging veterans kind of moving off into the sunset without actually training their replacements. And these people come up and they suck and they make shit games. And I mean, I guess we have the original two of the three still on this game and that explains it. But at the same time, you still feel like without John Carmack, there'd be a dip and not an increase. But it, is, it seems... I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, this is a little off subject, but I don't think the gaming industry really allows room for protégéing, especially in the Western gaming industry, maybe somewhat in the Eastern ones, but even like standout names like Hideo Kojima, I don't even think, mm-hmm. does he does he have an apprentice? <laughs> I don't think so. Yeah, it's, it's a big problem. And yeah. you're seeing it because all of the titans of the 90s and the golden age of gaming, they're all getting really old now. I think Hideo Kojima is in his late 50s, right? Yeah. So <laughs> so we're getting to this point now where these guys are they're going to retire and we're just going to have to deal with the new guys. And it seems like a lot of the new guys really suck, so I'm not looking forward to that transition at all. <laughs> this is why when you watch sci-fi and fantasy movies and you see civilizations and you're like why don't they know that that badass shit it's just like we lost it long ago <laughs> <laughs> i don't understand so uh do you think there's going to be a map editor this time because i know there uh, was there was there was i think there was for the the reboot right the original reboot i don't remember that I I remember seeing custom maps in that game. So you had to make them somehow, right? That's dope. I didn't even touch on that. Maybe, That's maybe, cool if it did. Maybe I'm tripping balls and I'm thinking of something else. But I I recall there being custom maps in multiplayer. I wonder how in depth it's going to go. That'd be super cool if you can make your own like elaborate like maps with different levels and different quick access shortcuts that go one way and stuff like that. That'd yeah, be dope. Well, I mean, if you look at the popularity of like Super Mario Maker on the Switch and you just apply that to Doom, I think that, I mean, obviously Mario has a way bigger following than Doom, but I still feel like if you make that thing easy enough to use, you could have some really cool Doom variants real quick. Oh, for sure. I mean, anybody that plays Halo, that's immediately where my mind went. It's just like pretty much mixed Halo with doom hmm. then make multiplayer that'd be fucking sick <laughs> you just yeah. make custom maps <laughs> i spent yeah. i spent weeks creating fucking maps on halo <laughs> i never made a single halo map which which one introduced that i think it was three it was called forge yeah i remember hearing about that, that yeah it must have come Either on three or after three, because I know it wasn't in one or two. But, uh, no, it, it was definitely that one. All right. Well, do you have any final thoughts on uh, Doom Eternal? I think it's fucking dope, and it's the second coming of Satan himself. <laughs> <laughs> um, Satan, <laughs> Satan. But it just—it looks fucking stellar. That shock and chain grappling combo looks especially sweet, and I also like. Just like all the executions. It reminds me of like almost God of War. Yeah. But for yeah, sure. I'm just, I'm fucking stoked for it. Can't wait to play it. Same. Uh, it looks really good. It looks like it might end up being my favorite Doom of all time. And that's really saying something based off of like two fucking trailers. But just what I've seen looks really good. And in the original trailer, they had some really good one liner jokes that I didn't expect. So like, uh, you know, like they're talking about diversity is our strength. Let's be friends with our demon kin or whatever. And as the demons are just killing everyone in the city, and it's, <laughs> it was like an apocalypse situation. So you can already see that they're they're playing with this. It's going to have some funny comedy moments and they're not afraid to be politically incorrect, which is always a great combination with this type of game. You don't want politically correct doom. No one wants that. So. I'm glad that that is a thing, and uh, yeah, I'm looking looking forward to it. We'll probably end up reviewing that here in a few months. Hail Satan. And we're back. 
with our review of The Mandalorian. As with all of our reviews here at the Crack Cellar, there are lots and lots of spoilers coming at you, so if you haven't seen this movie yet, you should probably pause right now, go watch it, and come back to us later. That being said, Broadcaster Nichols, is Baby Yoda a Sith Master? (laughs) Wouldn't that be the brightest timeline? Well, I'll tell you a few things here. He force choked somebody, and to me, that means you're a Sith. Done and done. (laughs) You know, in Rise of the Skywalker, spoilers, when Rey shot Sith Lightning, I was just like, oh shit, they're doing it. They're pulling a real Ryan Johnson. They're subverting expectation. They're going to turn it into a fucking (laughs) Sith Lord. (laughs) And then... My brain instantly was just like, that means Baby Yoda is probably going to be a fucking evil motherfucker, too. Mm -hmm. But, you know, a girl can dream. Yeah, it's uh, quite an awesome premise for season two, jumping all the way to the end. I think they're they're just going to use it as a, what do you call it, a carrot on a stick. I don't think they're ever going to do anything with it. Really? Nah, I mean, they're probably going to elaborate on him being a force user, because obviously Yoda's race was very force sensitive, but I don't think they're going to, my gut just tells me they're not going to do that. Oh, no, no, no. I'm talking about the end where uh, they set up season two to go off and look for the planet of Yoda's. Yeah. yeah, I I find that to be like the, literally the most interesting thing they could do for season two out of everything available to them. Not so, only do the most interesting thing they could probably do with the Star Wars universe right now in the yeah. past like eight years or so. Yeah, we know nothing about Yoda's race at all. For all we know, it's all Sith users except for Yoda, and he's the one good guy on the entire planet of Yoda's. <laughs> so far. We, <laughs> is that what you're saying? <laughs> yeah, it, it's just we know so little about his race. And the fact that George Lucas is consulting on this show pretty heavily, it just gives me really great hope for what's going to happen with this arc. Like, I I expect anything. That'd be a trip, dude. Just a bunch of evil midgets, dark lightsabers, just fucking whipping your ass. Yeah, we don't even know <laughs> if, if th- that race has a gender. They could all be the same gender, for all we know. It could yeah, reproduce they- asexually, like Godzilla. <laughs> That'd be something I didn't even think about. <laughs> that'd be interesting yeah you know a lot of people were saying just the fact that we call him baby yoda you know even though he's not people just think he's like a baby version of yoda like a clone or something like that <laughs> oh man there's another theory all the yodas are clones well they they went out of the way uh john farber or favreau uh said that he actually has a name, but they're being super secretive about it. Mm. Yep. And that's how you can really enjoy this show as a, an old school fan or just really a George Lucas Star Wars fan because you know how close Favreau is to George Lucas. So anything like this, you can trust that this has his blessing, essentially. For sure. It feels like that almost every episode. There's a couple duds in there, but overall, I like the whole vibe of the, the series with like this kind of a Western um, what is it? What, I want to really call it spaghetti western. Just kind of had like a deserty western vibe. I'd really dug. Yeah, it, that's always what George Lucas said. Star Wars was was a western. He always said that when people asked yeah. him what it was, he said it's not a sci-fi. It's a western. So again, you can kind of see why George Lucas is number two on the credits roll for this show. He's not stuck at the very back with like the special thanks. He's number two. For sure. And they, I also liked their very, very liberal use of violence. Like they didn't, mm-hmm. it's, it was weird how like it was a breath of fresh air, but at the same time, it almost kind of weirded me out with how much they were able to get away with in that series. You know, like with the one episode, I forget the kid, the young bounty hunter's name, but they just, you know, he just blasted that chick right at the end, dude. And I'm just, you know, and they kill a lot of people in Star Wars. Mm-hmm. You always see someone get done. But that was very malicious, you know? Like, you don't see a lot of a lot of 
kills like that in Star Wars. So, and then also they set the scene with the stormtrooper helmets being on spikes, all bloodied up. You know, at the beginning of town. Yeah. So you don't ever, you never seen that in any other Star Wars. So no, yeah. this show almost feels like a a middle finger to Disney a little bit because it kind of goes against everything Disney has tried to do with Star Wars up until now. Yeah, and can I say it's criminal, it's criminal that they killed Werner Herzog off already, dude. Him as the client was one of the best things that that series dude he was born to be a sith lord when i heard that guy it is difficult being a bounty hunter oh i, <laughs> I was know. like i was like dude where's this guy been man <laughs> yeah yeah going back going back to the very beginning of this show the first episode was so good can i mean let's let's talk about this think about every show you've ever seen in your life can you think of any that have a better first episode than the mandalorian it it boggles the mind. Episode? Any that- any show like for first episodes, as far as first episodes go, especially in sci fi though. Like if you look at Star Trek, the first episode of every Star Trek is total garbage. The, yeah. <laughs> it's always bad in the beginning. A lot of sci fi is bad in the beginning, but just shows in general. There are very few shows that have amazing first episodes, and I think Mandalorian is top tier. I can't think of any anything else. Maybe Lost, if you're a fan of Lost. The first episode, maybe the first two episodes, are up there. Yeah, I mean, I, t- I kind of look at Mandalorian like I look at most HBO short series and stuff, like Game of Thrones and stuff. They're very short and sweet. They're not these, like, you know, Stargate and Star Trek and Expanse mm. and all those type sci fi's where there's, well, that's not necessarily true. So Expanse is kind of a short season series, but the other two are not. And, you know, they kind of they have a lot more time and stuff. With these short baked ones, they always seem to be a lot more pleasing, you know? Yeah. Well, it's weird too because all the shows are like that now. You're right before, like, there were different. There's like 26 episode shows, there were 13 episode shows, there were eight yeah. episode shows. Now it seems like everything's kind of getting pushed into the middle, like around 12. But Mandalorian has that, that old school eight. It's a, a short and tight eight, except for one episode. I, I disagree that there's a few bad episodes. I think there's really only one bad episode. And I believe that that episode is Sanctuary. And honestly, if it weren't for the ATST in the episode, it would have been cosmically bad. But that part at least gave me some joy. That really did save the episode. There's no doubt about it. <laughs> yeah, because other than that, it was embarrassing. Like watching Mando just get beat by the girl. I forget what her name is. But every other scene in this show, Mando is like a fucking s-class ninja going around assassinating people and the second she shows up he like moves at like one-third speed like choreographing everything (laughs) he does just like being real shitty with all of his it was embarrassing to watch and is you know just look at us like oh okay so uh we're just going to slow down for her so that you conveniently be like oh she's powerful and i want to recruit you to be on my team and it's just the whole episode was so transparent with what they were trying to do with it and uh, it just felt like a bottle episode. It didn't even really need to happen. I think you could have cut that episode from the show. No one would have been the wiser and it would have been fine. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I guess I kind of agree with you then. I mean, there was really only one bad episode. Yeah, I thought most yeah, of them were really some good. Of those, some of them were kind of dull. You know, this might be, this might be a hot take. Oh, but, and I'm a huge fan of the guy. It's a crack seller, crack seller, crack seller. <laughs> hot take. Bill Burr is my boy. Oh, right? shit. Don't oh, know this is red on red crime. Yeah. Red on red crime. I don't know the man personally, but I'm not saying the man's a bad actor. I've only seen him. This is the only time, unless I'm forgetting something, but I think it's the only time I've ever seen him act. And he seemed really tense. He seemed like, I don't know. He seemed like he was, maybe it's because he always wanted to be on a Star Wars set. You know, I, I'd probably be the same fucking way, to be honest, but He's so anxious looking. It's, it, he he kind of stood. Maybe I was just staring at Bill Burr too much, but <laughs> it seemed like he wasn't actually acting. You know, like he was, <laughs> he seemed like this weird anomaly in the whole episode to me. It's whatever. I also thought some of the other actors in that episode were kind of cringy, like the chick playing the 
I forget the, sp- the species, but uh, the two tentacle chick. Yeah. She was one a of the classic the alien top. races that we don't <laughs> yeah. really remember their names. Yeah. Well, she was a little over the top. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's funny because that was one of my favorite episodes of the show, and it sounds like it might be your second least favorite. It's interesting. I thought the premise was good. I liked how, you know, I liked the rescue mission gone wrong and them trying to, you know, betray him at the last minute and, then, you know, the sibling rally. I thought it was all good on paper, if you will. And I like how the episode played out. I just kind of had some qualms with some of the acting. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, Bill Burr was definitely a guest, special guest appearance in, in terms and of good on him. <laughs> yeah. I would have done the same thing and I would have yeah, stuck up the joint. But I would have done it yeah. in a heartbeat. <laughs> But yeah, I can't blame the man, but he was definitely, you know, an actor among, you know, much better actors. And that's being very gracious. True, true. But I did like that episode overall. I thought it was I liked the premise. It kind of reminded me of like a like a cowboy bebop episode or something. It just had more of like a cool space crew vibe. And there hasn't been a lot of sci-fi shows lately that have that kind of vibe. You know, it's mostly clean, sanitized sci-fi. You have shows like The, the Expanse, which, you know, if when you watch it, you feel like it's just been coated with Purell. When it's, it's great, don't get me wrong, but it's so sanitized and so clean. And there isn't a lot of, uh, you know, space robberies on prison ships with, you know, betrayals and outlaw crews and shit like that. So... It was kind of a cool thing just to see that type of sci-fi again. And that the whole show is kind of like that. I mean, you start off in the very beginning and the whole – I love the tension with Mando early on in the show, specifically in the first episode. Where oh, dude. Every so, scene, yeah. like the silence is deafening when people try and talk to him and he kind of just sits there and he stares at him. And usually that's awkward. But instead of it being awkward, it was just kind of paralyzing when you're watching the scene. It worked really well. And even when he was going into the the uh, Imperial base with the stormtroopers and that awesome evil guy that I don't remember his name. IG-11? The robot? No, the, no, the, no, the dude you said should be a Sith Lord. Oh, oh, you're the guy that gave him the, the mission. Fuck him. Yeah. Or not Hort- Herzog. Yeah, that whole scene with him, just from beginning to end with him entering, the tension, the way that he acted, it, the bo- like everything about that scene was perfect. That was like if I were teaching, making television in a classroom, <laughs> yeah. I would use that scene. For sure. And it also like, it gave you that sense of what Tatooine was currently like. Because we hadn't seen... Tatooine since the original trilogy, essentially, right? In its current state. Like, I mean, we saw past Tatooines, but we'd never seen anything past the original trilogy for Tatooine. Yeah. I mean, you know, our, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I shouldn't say Tatooine overhaul because uh, Ray's story goes on on Tatooine. But that town in particular, what's that, t- that famous town? where like Oh, most likely. Most likely, yeah, that that one in particular. Like when you the first episode when he comes down again, you see the stormtrooper skulls on the pikes and shit like that, and you see Werner Herzog deliver the lines as as awesome as he does. It like sets this tone <laughs> that Moss Eisley has turned into some really really dark shit. <laughs> you know, it's <laughs> controlled by like this dark syndicate. <laughs> yeah, it it was really cool and. I loved all the planets. That was the one thing that I really liked about Rogue One. Uh, I don't think Rogue One's the greatest movie of all time, but other than the Darth Vader scene at, at the end, my favorite thing about Rogue One is that there's just like a string of like eight different planets and they were all so cool looking and so Star Wars looking and it felt like you were on an exploration journey through space again, which is kind of how the original trilogy felt yeah. and the prequel trilogy as far as I'm concerned. But uh, oh, yeah. that's one thing I didn't really feel with the new pre- or sequel trilogy is it doesn't really feel like that until Rise of Skywalker. And that's, again, one of the reasons why I rated Rise of Skywalker so high, because it did kind of the same thing. You know, we're, we're in space. We don't need to be in the same spot the entire fucking movie or the entire fucking show. Let's let's go through space a little bit. Well, the crazy thing is, is they have this ex- extraordinary universe to pick from, too. There's probably 
I mean, I'm not crazy, crazy into Star Wars. I only can assume a couple dozen worth of planets out there that they haven't even touched on in the cinematic universe. Oh, you know, like Dathomir and uh, like all the planets recently in uh, the new game. Yeah. Uh, You know, uh, Ilum. Well, Ilum was in Force uh, Awakens, but it was devastated and turned into a machine already. (laughs) Yeah. And you don't even have to go to old planets. I mean, it's space. You can just make new. I mean, look, there's Yavin 4. What about Yavin 2? What about Yavin 6? You know what I mean? Like, there's so much you can do. And it's so criminal how, like, most of the the prequel, or not the prequel, most of the sequel trilogy was spent, like, on the same sets, not even on different planets. Just a lot of, I don't know. It's you know it's my old man sci-fi gripe I guess at this point it's like why are we in space if we're just going to be in this ship ninety percent of the movie? Yeah, I think it's just because it's a huge blockbuster movie and it always will be and they don't want to change too much too fast. Yeah. I mean, I think honestly, if I dare I say, Kathleen Kennedy and her goons got their way that was kind of what they were going to do. I mean, they were going to try to turn it into like a MCU type thing, you know, a Marvel cinematic universe. Mm -hmm. The next thing they were going to have solos and, and uh, rogue ones and, and other types of, uh, you know, standalone movies that all played into this larger storyline, you know, and that was, you'd probably get what you wanted out of that. They'd probably start to go explore new planets but at what cost daniel at what well, cost <laughs> <laughs> what's funny too is that rion johnson cost them all that the only reason that everyone hates star wars it's not because solo was that bad people as soon as last jedi happened it completely changed star wars fandom forever there was no going back anymore it was there's blood in the water so there's just a huge amount of people that they don't care how good a Star Wars movie is at this point. If they see Kathleen Kennedy on the credits, they're going to say it's bad. And that's just how it is now because there's too much bad will towards that woman and towards Rian Johnson for Last Jedi. Yeah, like you said, there's there's too much bad blood. She should definitely exit out of of the, what do they call Star Wars? Disney? Like, I mean, it's it's all just just Disney umbrella now. I mean, yeah, whatever department she is employed by, with i mean she just needs to step out of that she needs to let somebody i'm surprised Iger hasn't actually done anything surprising yeah. well it's, there's been a rumor that kevin feige the guy who did mcu is going to switch to star wars and that's been a rumor for years now ever since last shit i came out basically it's been a rumor but what do you think about that do you think that would even be good because i'm kind of mixed on mcu I, I know it's unpopular opinion but i don't think the mcu is as great as everyone says i think there were a couple great movies sprinkled into a sea of mediocrity you know i don't totally agree with that statement i mean i'm more of a marvel comic fan than you are so i kind of have a bias maybe a little bit more biased than you do with some of these characters, you know, like when I, I'm just grateful, you know, I get a comic movie that for certain types of, you know, squads and characters and stuff like that. Like I'm a huge Iron Man fan. I thought personally, Iron Man three suck balls, <laughs> but you know what? I got a fucking Iron Man three and I'm okay with that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so, but there, you're right. I mean, some weren't as good as the others, but uh, Back to my what I was going to originally say is Kevin Feige. I don't totally agree with his style, but one ability I do really like of his is to stay loyal to original content enough. Like he he pleases me. That I've never seen him put something out where I was just like that. Just that's whack. Like it has nothing to do with the character. He always has like even when the, it's as far as. Uh, a part as you can get for Kevin Feige making a character. It's still, he does still does a clever way of connecting it back or like, you know, shouting out back to old uh, versions of the character. So he, he has that ability and I, I like that. And if he brings that to star Wars in a good way, then awesome. 
but he also will bring, you know, the inherent social justice type shit that comes with well, MCU nowadays. And, and that's the thing. So if you believe the current uh, rumor on where Star Wars is going, it's Old Republic. So you're potentially handing over Revan and Malik to Kevin Feige for his first Star Wars movies. Does that not terrify you? Because, I mean, it terrifies me. That's what... Wait a minute. Since when is that going on? That's been the rumor for a while, is that they're going to Old Republic now because they there's so much bad will with the future Star Wars universe. They just want to go back to as far away as they can to That's reset. A smart, smart fucking move, to be honest. It is a smart move, but I just don't, I don't know. I don't look at Kevin Feige as well as other people do, and I've... Civil War, I thought, was such a hokey piece of shit, and I feel like that Civil was War the... Sucked. I thought that was the definition of the Kevin Feige style, that movie. And you, it, it didn't, again, works it didn't. in some movies, but it didn't in that one. And everyone loved that movie. So it just worries me that it's they're so going to see that as a litmus test to quality that I don't agree with. Did Kevin Feige actually do Civil War, though? I think it was the one he was the most involved with out of all of them. Mm. I know sure? the Avengers movies in general are the ones that he had the most to do with. And I heard that Civil War was one of the uh, the few non-Avengers ones that he really had a heavy hand in. Because it kind of was an Avengers movie, if you think about it. Civil War essentially was. Yeah, he really didn't have too much to do with that. Looks like Russo. It was the Russo motherfuckers that made that one. The ones that made Endgame and infinity war well yeah kevin feige is just a high up dude on all these movies but there are some that he's more involved in than others yeah he says he didn't he's not credited for much no screenplay no writer no directing yeah so so you're you're on board with kevin feige's management of star wars and you're you're you would see that as a positive not a negative i mean it's a positive to the current state (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yep i would like to see an alternate timeline where jj had the entire trilogy and didn't hand it over for part two but we're never yeah. going to see that so that would be cool i think oh, we well. just had a i think we would have had a spiritual successor to the original trilogy yeah. i think that's what he was really going for he's trying to make a modern original trilogy and uh yeah current current hollywood had to fucking put their dick right into it <laughs> <laughs> fuck it up <laughs> yeah but uh and wouldn't it be cool if they just gave it back to george lucas <laughs> hey you can make this old republic trilogy george lucas wouldn't that like i might have a heart palpitation i might have to like put in, <laughs> somebody have to call 911 if that happened well if that's cool just, if it goes back to the old republic then we could tie this podcast right back to what we originally talked about the mandalorian and we could do the ten thousand year war Oh, now, that would be fucking cool, dude. So you start actually seeing some real Mandalorians, fucking some war type shit. Yeah. <sighs> and and what did you think about the fact that they kind of debut the Mandalorians as a religion instead of a race? Because I found that to be one of the best things they did, like writing decision wise. Well, it's always been a religion. I mean, not always mm, been a religion. Not but in, in canon, the- maybe in the books, but. I didn't know about the religion. No one that just watched the movies knew about the religion. No, no. Well, I mean, people that watched the movies didn't really know much about Mandalorians well, general besides well, Boba Fett. Well, no, yeah, you thought they were a race of bounty hunters. That's what yeah, that's what everyone yeah. thought. That just like the you know Bosk, whatever his race is, the dinosaur people, uh, the IGs. For sure. I you just kind saying. of all thought that they were just races of bounty hunters. But yeah, the in the expanded universe, they were actually a, a race. That got fucked on too much, and uh, they started to go extinct. So they allowed their ranks to be jo- like just any species to join their ranks, hmm. and then that's when it kind of became like this religion to be a Mandalorian. Interesting, or, or a Mandalore, or whatever. <laughs> that hmm. that beast, that symbol, you know, with the horns and like shit on the side of his shoulder. That's um, or on Boba Fett's, I should say is a, like a beast they conquer on their home planet or something mm-hmm. like that. It's like yeah, a it's right the mythosaur, right? Yeah, something like that. Yeah. But yeah, they mention it in the Mandalorian, yeah. I'm pretty sure. 
Yeah, the Nick Nolte's character, which was yeah. probably my favorite non uh, Mando character in the show. I have spoken. Yeah, it was so awesome when he did that. And it's so I was so sad that he died. Like of all, it's funny because I knew I think someone his name was, was going to die. Or Quinn. I, I don't remember. It was like a weird one of those weird names that you can't remember. <laughs> yeah. But he was one of the Urgot guys, which are like a race of like repairmen type, like tinker, engineer, robot, uh, people work on droids, stuff like yeah. that. And I thought that was really cool. And just the direction overall of the show was to like be a love letter to old school trilogy fans. It, there were so many original trilogy races that you have not seen in so long in this show. I couldn't even believe it sometimes, like going way beyond the Jawas, which again, God, I loved the. That was so cool. <laughs> I loved the second episode, not as much as the first, but the second episode was really good. Watching Baby Yoda take that beast down, watching the Jawas and the Sand Cruisers, and it's just, you know, people will call it member berries, but it's like, dude, give me a fucking break. What do you want from a Star Wars television show? Because this is what I want. What do you want? <laughs> I think people just crave new material and they want it to be wrapped in a nostalgic shell, you know, with a soft new nougat center that yeah. keeps them excited well the way i look at it is if you're gonna call it star wars why are you calling it star wars because it's star wars right then so you should use star wars things and you shouldn't just like invalidate everything that happened in the past star wars otherwise you could just call it what you're calling it like the the subtitle of whatever your star wars movie is just call it the subtitle because it's its own thing you're not using star wars stuff and that was a big problem, I think, in the sequel trilogy as well. There's just a lot of uh, a lot of replacement of stuff that didn't really make sense. Yeah. Speaking of things that didn't make sense, what do you think about the shadow at the end of the Gunslinger episode? Oh. They never touched on it. Wow, I forgot about that. Yeah, I, mean, I, I totally forgot about that till you brought it up. Our brother over at dirty randy productions me and him were talking about the possibilities of who that might be and we were thinking maybe boba fett hmm it hmm the man himself god wouldn't that be awesome <laughs> it'd be pretty cool oh i love that theory i hope that's true i hope and we get a mando versus boba fett encounter in season two that would be the shit I, there's also a rumor going on that uh ashoka is gonna Ahsoka, Ashoka. I'm not sure how you say it, but I always say uh, Ahsoka. Ahsoka. Or wait, no, it is Ahsoka. I, yeah, on Clone Wars, uh, yeah, Anakin pronounces it Ahsoka. So yeah, so she's rumored to be in the second season, and supposedly Rosio Dawson is um, sounding out, sounding off about wanting to be it <laughs> or the uh, the actor. That'd be Actress. sweet because I love Rosario Dawson. She is like one of the few Hollywood actresses that isn't PC and isn't one of those people that are on Twitter being retards right now. So I would love to reward her with a fucking cool ass role like Ahsoka in the man. It would be dope. She yeah. kind of has like no do no no hate on her because I think she's fucking beautiful. But I th like her face. If you like, just put the prosthetic on her. You can actually see it. Mm -hmm. No, for sure. <laughs> it's actually, well, so can she. That's why she brought it yeah. up, man. She sees yeah. herself in the mirror. She's like, I can be a Soka. <laughs> for sure, dude. Like, it's there. Yeah, for sure. Ah, oh, man. Yeah, I love the. I love the writing and the direction of this show. I feel just like it's so much higher than anything other than maybe like prime Game of Thrones. Uh, obviously, the the final season took a huge dip in the writing department, but. It, when you look at the writing in the show, other than that one episode, it just felt so tight and like you were just always on this ride and it was never, it was never rattling. It wasn't jerking your head left and right. It was super smooth and had all the right turns. And I love the RPG elements of this show too as a RPG nerd. I felt like I was watching an, an RPG called The Mandalorian with the way that he took quests completed quest gained his currency went back to his class center yeah talked to his class master yep. build me a new piece of my armor like Mega Man x capsule style puts it on and it just continued throughout the whole show he just continually built up his armor well no he got that one piece and then he got the rest of the armor 
built all at once. Remember, you got that one job and got the rest of that fucking Beskar steel. Right, but I mean, it. in an eight-episode show, like, over two episodes, yeah, no, no, I'm that's not kind knocking. of what I'm talking about. Like, I'm just you saying. You don't want every episode to be, it doesn't need to be a trope. It doesn't just all, need to be there to be there. All I'm saying, in a real RPG, it ain't that fucking easy. Right? <laughs> 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 well, definitely not if it was made in the 90s, but... <laughs> Yeah, that that could depend on a lot of things in the year 2020. But an uh, RPG yeah, we, in 2020. <laughs> that's right. We must be talking about a remake of a 97 RPG. <laughs> <laughs> if they delay that shit again, okay. <laughs> so I liked I liked a lot of the characters in the show, but there were a few that sucked. Like you mentioned in the Bounty Hunter episode, the the female ear girl. I always just call, think of them as their long, the long ear girls, like kind of like ear. weird tentacle girls. Uh, her and her brother, I thought were obnoxious, and I hated them. I didn't like uh, Bill Burr's character either. I was with you on that, but I probably didn't hate him as much as you did. But he kind of just is just like it was jarring, is what it was. Yeah, you just looking sure. like you don't belong here. You're just here as a favor. It's taking me out of the show now because I know that and. It, but you can't blame the man. And then uh, Nick Nolte's character was pretty awesome, too. And he's dead now, unfortunately. But what do you think about Baby Yoda in His character general? is dead. Yes, his character is dead. <laughs> what do you think about Baby Yoda in general? Because this entire show is basically the Baby Yoda show. It says it's the Mandalorian, but really, <laughs> it's the Yoda, the Baby Yoda. Because- well, the Mandalorian's like it's like it's a, a story of a babysitter. It's a classic babysitter mm-hmm. story. You know, you got the Mandalorian and the baby. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So, so what do you think about that? Do you like the fact that the whole show is essentially a uh, red herring for just being about this baby Yoda character? Do you like baby Yoda? For sure. I mean, I thought it all played well for the first season, taking it into the second season, I guess, proposing this question in that way, I would be worried if it doesn't have a payoff, if they just continue to have another sideline story in season two, like maybe introducing Ahsoka and doing something with her or some shit, which would be cool. Don't get me wrong. But if that's going to be it and then still not explain baby Yoda, like just totally keep us in the dark, like not give us a name. Don't give us, you know, they don't even reach the planet to the very fucking final episode type shit. I'm going to be disappointed. That that's what I kind of worry about Mm. because because it's like i gotta wait till season three now to see another fucking yoda species you really fucking give me wait 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 (laughs) wait a second though but what it now let's just go a level down the crack cellar right now what if the entire second season is not only mando looking for the yoda planet but boba fett chasing him down while he's doing it like stalking him through space how sick would that be uh, that'd be dope That'd be super dope. Him running from Boba Fett, Boba Fett from, for some mysterious reason. Yeah. And then they finally get to the planet and like, you know, it all uh, coincides with some like epic meaning or, you know, yeah, you some could, shit like that. Totally. You could make like Boba Fett sort of like an undertaker character where like uh, Mando will beat him up a bit, but then he'll just be unfazed and Mando will have to run away and then get to the next planet. Happens that'd be again, so you know fucking I mean? cool! Like, <laughs> that'd yeah. be so cool. They won't do that, <laughs> probably not. But yeah. at least with the level of writing that we've seen in this show, you can at least fathom that it could happen because the writing's good. So, if the writing was good in season one, you know, they're probably going to come up with some shit in season two that's good as well. Yeah. Well, this all hinges on the idea that that was Boba Fett as the shadow i mean (laughs) it could be ahsoka like who knows maybe like some jedi was on tatooine and they heard the ruckus and they were just like watching him the whole time how much maybe it was ahsoka how much you want to bet that they did that on purpose so that they didn't know who the character was yet oh for sure and introduce someone (laughs) i'm a huge let's put a shadow in there (laughs) dude i'm always a huge fan of that fucking theory every time Uh, i see shit like that i'm just like they don't know what the fuck they're doing they're just probing the internet to see what's cool it's like oh yeah that that's definitely cool we're doing that they just look at all the fan (laughs) theories and pick from the one they like (laughs) (laughs) probably i wouldn't be surprised but it was really nice to watch a star wars property with no sjw politics at all in it I mean, unless you count the the death trooper, shock trooper chick, but 
I don't really, I don't think that she was an SJW character. She did beat Mando in a very like, okay, that was a stupid way. Because that fight was so bad. That was the worst. I think that was the only part of the show that I absolutely hated was when Mando fought her. But I didn't think it was too bad. I mean, she's a professional fighter. She I don't care, dude. Fast. It was, doesn't matter because it had nothing <laughs> to do with her. It had to do with Mando, like, cueing his shit one-third speed, obviously way slower than he did in every other fight. In the- what about, dude, on The Prisoner, that episode we were talking about with the bounty hunters, when when he started going after them all, he was fucking moving at, like, a thousand miles per hour, just, like, I doing know. crazy ninja shit. But in that episode, he moved like he was like, humpty I'll give you a couple reasons, all right? <laughs> it was a woman. He was caught off guard. <laughs> Two, <laughs> he was n- caught off guard. <laughs> Three, <laughs> Three, he sensed it was a woman with his force powers. <laughs> Mando is the real last Skywalker. <laughs> We're you all know. Skywalkers now. <laughs> I am Daniel Skywalker. <laughs> yeah. I have I mean, just as get, much of a right as Ray to say that, so she can go fuck herself. I guess to move this forward a little bit, uh, you know, another part that I was kind of disappointed in in this series, not an episode. I thought the episode was awesome, just a part, was when they did the helmet reveal. Or the face reveal, I should say. I yeah. I just thought it shouldn't have happened. I, I think it would have been way better if... Because, I mean, we all know who the fucking guy is. It's no secret. We know who's under the mask. It's not like they're keeping the actor a secret or anything like that. So I thought it would have been way cooler for like in um, a meta uh, perspective that it didn't actually show the viewer, the face it showed IG 11, the face, like they went out of their way to make sure you knew IG 11 saw his face. And then it would have been even cooler when IG-11 ultimately died, you know, so the one person that saw Mandalorian's face isn't around anymore. You know, I thought that would have been way cooler way to approach the whole thing. The idea that they showed us his face, just it just, I don't know, it humanized him a little bit more. And I was, I didn't like that. <laughs> yeah, I don't think they needed to show his face there. It wasn't necessary. No, but I, I didn't have a problem with the way they did it. I thought the way they did it was good, because if, if he showed his face to a human... I would have been pissed. Yeah, because I definitely would have been it would have just totally invalidated everything we just watched. But yeah, I mean, I could, I could see where you're coming from on that. But that last episode, <sighs> though, how dope was that? Oh, it was so good, and you I had, was one of the, that was the second best episode, in my opinion. Same, yeah, maybe, I'd go maybe f- third. It's like it's the first gunslinger in this the eighth episode. Ooh, gunslinger is your number two, huh? It's it's in between. I mean, the gunslinger was just I thought it was really good. I liked oh, it, but yeah. uh, when I was looking online at what people thought about the show in general, a lot of people didn't like Gunslinger. Really? I thought that was surprising, too, because I liked it a lot. But yeah. it, it's weird. that So it's your second favorite. I actually had the uh, – I have the first episode as my favorite. The last episode is my second favorite. And the uh, the Bounty Hunter one is my third. So, And you didn't mm-hmm. like the Bounty Hunter one very much, which I find interesting. So it seems like we both like the show in somewhat different ways. Yeah, for sure. But, I mean, back to the eighth episode, that, that fucking episode was out of the park. I couldn't believe all the different things they showed. <laughs> they ended it with a with a dark saber. That's that's crazy. He just mm-hmm. like nonchalantly just whips out a dark saber and cuts himself out of the tie the down tie fighter. It's just he, like yeah, I keep this on my side. <laughs> yeah, and it's so funny too because I remember when I was watching Breaking Bad and they first introduced that guy as the villain of the show. I was like, this is a fucking Emperor Palpatine right here. <laughs> and then he becomes a fucking Sith 10 years later in Star Wars. I fucking love it. What's his name? Moff. It's Grimm. like Gionardo Carlino or something like that. That's his real name? Yeah. Oh, okay. I was going to say, I was like, I think it's Gideon, right? Moff Gideon or something yeah, I don't, like that? Yeah, I don't remember his actual character name in the show, but apparently he's a Sith, not a Moth. So. <laughs> no, he's a Grand Moth. That's so, so you, so you think that the Grand Moths now just have lightsabers, or do you, you not think he's no, a No, I think he's just, as a particular, you know, there's certain butterflies that 
or caterpillars that you know cocoon and well I become guess, other things i guess you're right because <laughs> this isn't the actual empire as we know it i kind of forget that sometimes this is yeah this is post of, the empire yeah so this is sort of like a new empire where maybe a sith would be well, a moth yeah i was reading something that kind of said that the idea for mandalorian is kind of insinuating that they're going with what they call empire wardens or something like that. That's what Werner Herzog's character was. They're pretty much like these warlords that go throughout the planet that are ex empire. And they kind of just run these mafia type Mm -hmm. rings, you know? Well, it makes sense. If you have like a super star star destroyer that you're in command of and the empire falls apart and you're just kind of left there to just be like, well, what do we do now? Of course, if you're the dude in charge of the ship, you're like, we're going to go right along, but guess who's giving the orders now? (laughs) That makes sense, actually. Well, it was was really cool to have that black lightsaber. I mean, that was straight out of Jedi Knight, too. Yeah, well, the darksaber has a lot of lore behind it. I I think it's the first time it's ever been on the the scene. Oh, it's definitely on film. It's never been on film before, for (laughs) sure. It was so casual. (laughs) Yeah, the only other time it's been on anything visual, uh, as far as I know, is Jedi Knight 2. I don't remember in Jedi Knight 2. Oh, yeah, it was one of the lightsabers you could build. You could build a black lightsaber. No, that's different. The dark, the dark blade is different. No, there's no, you can, there's a crystal you can get that makes the lightsaber in Jedi Knight two look exactly like that one. He busted out. I had it. I used it for a long time. No, I mean, it may kind of look like it, but that was just a black lightsaber in Jedi Knight two. That's just a crystal that was in Jedi Knight two. The, there's actually an item called the dark blade and that definitely looked like what Moff Gideon had. And it's uh, there's only like two in existence, and it's been traditionally um, held by a like a Sith Lord or like a dark mother, evil motherfucker. Hmm. It came from the expanded universe. Like it, we we didn't even think it was canon. Well, it's not canon until it happened. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's it is now canon. Even <laughs> yeah. in the past, uh, when Disney bought. Uh, Star Wars, it actually made all the video games not canon, too. So Shadow of Empire and Rogue Squadron, all those games from the past are no longer canon. Yeah. Which, I mean, isn't terrible. I mean, they didn't... I mean, Jedi Knight... It's a shame that, like, Jedi Knight 2 isn't... Well, any of the Jedi... What what, it, what was it? It was Dark Forces. Dark Forces, was, Dark Forces 2, two Jedi, Jedi Knight, Knight, and Jedi Knight Jedi 2. Knight 2 outcast right yeah and then it was academy after that that whole that whole series dude was super dope i thought the kyle katarn it was like series was super cool and with like you know the de- it wasn't even sith lord in that. that that was the really cool part about that game is that they touched on dark jedi what was the evil guy's name Jarek or something in his gang of dark jedi like that was dope <laughs> yeah no it was and uh the sad thing is the rumor was that the Game of Thrones guys, when they were doing a trilogy, that they were going to do a Kyle Katarn trilogy. And that would be so cool. So with them gone, that's in the trash can, which really sucks. But honestly, Revan and Malik would be my number two right behind Kyle Katarn. So not a not a bad change. If they do Revan and Malik right, man, they could kickstart a whole new life for the Star Wars franchise. They could. You know? And the cool thing would be, do you, is it is he is Revan going light or dark? They could go either way, and then establish think, one as canon. I think it, well, I thought canon was dark side. Well, it is. Uh, it's, if you believe it's canon, which it's not, because Disney invalidated all the old Star Wars games from being canon, oh, so it is. I thought no you were just going based on old canon. Essentially. Well, well, no. If if we're talking about the the canon within those games, yeah. Then the Darth Revan is the canon outcome. Yeah. Yes. That'd be lame if they did a good Revan. I don't want to see that. <laughs> I don't want to see that. <laughs> well, uh, they were real careful to say, you know, all that shit in the past that you love, that's not canon anymore. And so it's they so, can do whatever they want. It's so perfect, too, because he shares the archetype of Anakin Skywalker. So it's like a new character that a lot of people that don't get into the expanded universe know about Mm -hmm. right and he shares almost all the same archetype attributes as anakin he's a good guy and then he turns turns out he starts slipping to the dark side the fight gets his memory 
he's one of the most powerful Sith Lords ever. I mean, he he finds his role a little bit differently, but they both they hit the milestones the same. <laughs> yeah, totally. And and uh, bringing it back to the Mandalorian, dude, you could explain why Revan's mask looks like a Mandalorian mask. I have always wondered that. There are a thousand theories on the internet about it. You could establish canon on that, and you could maybe even tie it into Mandalorian somehow. That'd be cool. (laughs) It would be, yeah. There's so much potential with Star Wars right now. I really feel like the Mandalorian, like you talk about Star Wars Episode Four: A New Hope, it's really Star Wars Mandalorian, A New Hope. That is what this show (laughs) has done for Star Wars, because... Man, oh man, if you're going to say, hey, what do we got on schedule for the next 10 years of Star Wars? Well, guess what? Rion Johnson's doing three trilogies. I, I would not. I'd be done. I'd just be done. I and I'm the biggest, one of the biggest Star Wars nerds on the planet, and I would be done. So I'm just really glad that they've handed off the reins to, at least right now on television, a genius and someone who's obviously listening to George Lucas, not shunning him, saying, go home, old man. Well, yeah, I mean, John Favreau is again. I think he, you know, he again, he's the guy that made the original Iron Man, which is one of the best Marvel movies out there. Oh know? yeah, but maybe even to a more powerful degree, that he stays true to content. He puts his he puts his finger in there, you know, gives it his little mark, but he he has a really true baseline that no one can mistake when they see his adaptations. Yeah, yeah, and it is funny because John Favreau did basically make the best MCU movie, other than arguably the first Infinity War. But if you try and come at me and say Endgame is better than Iron Man one, get the fuck out of here. Yeah, they're high, it's fucking way high. Endgame but, was, I think, dude, it's kind of crazy because people say Rise of the Skywalker is all over the place, too quick, and you know all this crap. I'm just like, but you guys like Endgame. Endgame is being praised. Mm-hmm. It's fucking an awesome movie, and I thought it was all right. But I think Star Wars: Rise of Skywalker is better than Endgame. Personally, yeah. I think Rise of Skywalker is better than Endgame. <laughs> oh, I do too. If if you had a gun to my head and said pick one, I'm taking Rise of Skywalker over Endgame every day. I think sure. Endgame is one of the most overrated movies in modern cinema. Honestly, the when I saw the reviews for that movie, I was just like, <laughs> "Who thinks this?" I mean, it was good. It wasn't that fucking good. I like, give I it a there solid some, seven. Yeah, there's point five. There were some good moments. Like I thought when, and I don't even like Chris Evans that much. You know, when I thought Chris Evans delivered that fucking quiet assemble Avengers assemble line, that was pretty cool. Yeah, like, that was like the first time where I was just like, man, this guy actually sounds like looks like he's dying. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I didn't like the movie on a fundamental level because it stepped on what made Infinity War Part One great, and so. Personally, I like to think of Infinity War Part 1 as the end of the MCU. (laughs) (laughs) Truly. But yeah, anyways, I mean, Jon Favreau, I I think from here on out, he's proven that when his name is part of the project, he should just should be psyched. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. I'll bet they've already offered him to do the trilogy, and he's like, eh, I'm busy. (laughs) (laughs) But what do you think about the music? That was one of the weird things about Mandalorian. I don't dislike the music, but I thought it was a pretty big departure from the classic John Williams style Star Wars music. Um, it definitely was, but I also like that. I thought that was really refreshing. It was. It's kind of got old after a while. It seemed like they didn't have a lot of variety in the OST. Definitely, but, not. you know, maybe they could put a little bit more budget towards that next season and get another theme, knock it out of the park with that and start to expand from there. But it was at least refreshing not to hear the same fucking overture just redone slightly over and over and over. It's just fucking, it, it's, I think that was one of the things that we didn't bring up in the, uh, or actually we haven't done it yet, but I, I think that is one thing I'll bring up in the Jedi fallen order review is that the music, while it isn't, you know, the original Star Wars music, it's damn fucking close. It's just, it's fucking not original. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it, I thought the music was decent, but I didn't, I don't know if I liked it as much as you. I think that in parts, 
it seemed a little repetitive and there was only one track that I thought was really good. And most of them were just kind of like, they're almost like they weren't even really there. Like it was ghost music. You'd almost forget there was music in the, one of the most, you know what I'm going to say? It's very, a uh, non memorable soundtrack. One of the least memorable soundtracks of all time. Yeah. Well, I think you're kind of going with the generic Western vibe, you know, kind of mm-hmm. just plays in the background, you know, you don't really notice it too much, at least after you, you're kind of used to the, the song and dance. Yeah. Yeah. But it made up for it in just really cool shit. So much really cool shit happened in this show in the very beginning when, uh, <laughs> I love it when he first takes the mission and he's going back to his ship on the ice and he establishes, I don't like droids. You know, he's like, no droids, no droids. And he's like, okay, man. And he calls in like that weird fat dude from the Sarah Silverman show to, to fucking drive him <laughs> with his beat up shallant that's like, bl- like blowing a muffler. And I just love the fact that he's all like, you know, I'd get off the ice and then pays him and then. <laughs> And he like just, gets taken out. And he just immediately gets taken out. It's just like <laughs> that type of writing and then just like that type of creature is what I expect from Star Wars. I ex- for sure. That whole scene where the creature goes, gets the dude, comes back, goes for the ship, gets the ship's landing gear, and then Mando has to come out on the side like a badass with his lightning spear and just fucking poke the thing like it's the blob from Heavyweights. I yeah. thought that was a perfect way to start a Star Wars television show. For sure. It was really good. It reminded me of Han Solo on the asteroid, you know, fighting the space, that giant space alien or yeah. running away. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I actually think this almost feel like John Favreau watched Empire Strikes Back right before he created the show. It almost felt like his mind was in specifically in Empire Strikes Back because just everything about it just felt like that movie from a direction standpoint. For sure. Well, it's a good idea because he knows that that's like the most loved Star Wars. So mm-hmm. if, it's a, if there's a movie to get in your fucking skull, that's the one. <laughs> yeah. What did you think about IG becoming a nanny at the end? I thought that was pretty funny the way they <laughs> reintroduced him as a permanent character by making him good. Yeah, it was pretty funny. Did you know that guy was voiced by uh, Taika or Takai Watati or whatever? No. Yeah. Wow, that's cool. He actually did. He actually wrote the last episode too, or directed it, I should say. That's what's up. Yeah, I love that last episode, and not even just because of the black lightsaber. Just it—it it was such a perfect conclusion, and I love it when a season delivers on what it sets up. There's so often you get these TV shows that sets up something in the beginning, and then you get to the end, and it's just like nothing resolves, nothing happens. Come back next year. I loved how they just totally wrapped up season one with a ribbon, but perfectly set up a season two at the same time in a way that's going to excite eh, 90% of fans. It was just a brilliant, brilliant way to write a, a single season. For sure. It had all the, it had all the good tropes, you know, it had some solid characters by the end of the season. They were all left behind and it started over with just the Mandalorian and the baby again. I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah. And again, the RPG elements at the end, he assembles his team. He has all these people helping him. He even gets Carl Weathers to, you know, be a triple trader. What is that? Triple agent? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Turns Carl Weathers into a triple agent. It, it was just really, it was such a great vibe for a television show. I think that's really what it comes down to is you, shows all kind of feel the same now in 2020. He, and don't forget, sh- he got his ultimate item too, his jetpack. <laughs> oh, dude. <laughs> Again, RPG elements, man. There's so many RPG elements in this television show. I think that's why I like it so much. He's now a true fucking bounty hunter. True Mandalorian. Maybe it's Boba Fett's pack, dude, and that's why he's chasing him to Yoda's planet to get his fucking jet pack. Nah, the armor built it just for him. Dude, dude, a trickery. Dark arts, man. I'm telling you. Fucking plot twist. The armor is Boba (laughs) Fett. The armorer is fucking Boba Fett. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I really liked what they did with the armorer, too. It gave me, like, a God of War vibe. It was really cool. I thought it was super cool. When, like, he brings the Baskar steel to her. Like, I was like, this is fucking dope. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I wish they would have kept that going for another couple episodes, though. 
I, I no, no, no. If the episode, if they would have done two more episodes, I wish that's what they would have elaborated on the most is making another episode where he kind of puts the armor together sl- more, a little bit more slower, and they show the underground a little bit more with like the fledglings and the and the other Mandalorians, like the giant dude with the fucking minigun who was just in it. Like at least they showed us him him fighting. That was cool. I didn't expect that to be honest, but now he's dead. Uh, who's who's your favorite character? My favorite character, other than Mando. Mm-hmm. I think it was probably between fucking Werner Herzog and uh, IG Eleven. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, I liked IG Eleven. I felt like I wanted him to come back sooner. It sucked that he was gone for most of the show. Yeah. Every time I see an IG unit, it just always reminds me of Shadow of the Empire. Because that, when I was a kid and I played that game, that certain part of the storyline with that IG series hunts you down. Fucking, oh, yeah. It scared the shit out of me when he jumps you in the junkyard because I never knew what to do. <laughs> they always <laughs> killed me. And I was like, fuck. <laughs> but yeah, yeah IG-11 is always an iconic character for me. Yeah, I... Uh... I liked IG-11. He was a weird character, the, the way that the, he started off and then they reprogrammed and it kind of fits in with Mando's hatred for droids and he had to prove himself to Mando and they like kind of expertly wrote in a scenario where he would by saving baby Yoda when all hope was lost. And yeah, it's just another example of really strong writing. There are not a lot of plot holes in the show. Everything kind of leads somewhere and it's refreshing. For sure, I, you know. Now, actually, now that I think about it, I would say IG Eleven and uh, Quill, the uh, Nick Nolte's character. Hmm. Those two were pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. Rest in peace. <laughs> <laughs> he come back. He could be a Sith Lord. It was all a trap. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, so any any other episodes specifically you want to talk about? The one, I, I mean, episode two was pretty good. That was the one with the sand, cro- the jaw was, and the sand people, and he was, uh, uh, what was he doing? He was getting something back, wasn't he? Didn't he get jacked or something like that? I forget. Oh, yeah, yeah. They, they fucking ransacked his ship. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. the jaw was. That one, the that one I mean, yeah, that one was pretty good. Don't get me wrong. But, I mean, it just wasn't too standout to me, besides that scene when they had him fucking scrunched into the fucking... <laughs> sand crawler <laughs> that was pretty funny yeah yeah i really liked the first episode i love the second second episode too the third episode is probably one of my top episodes of the show actually after one and two and probably yeah. six just because That's- i loved the way they portrayed mando going through with it they didn't just immediately make him go against his code as a bounty hunter he went through with it he kept seeing things that made him want to not go through with it, but he kept going through with it until he finally broke at the very end. And the way they did it was, it was really cool. It was, uh, it was moving almost for sure. And made him, made him have a heart (laughs) cold bounty hunter with a heart. Well, it's just like everything you establish in episodes one and two, you're like, this is a grizzled badass bounty hunter who doesn't talk to anyone. He's a, fucking asshole won't show his face to anyone has all the typical traits of a bounty hunter and for them to realistically have him switch like that and for you to believe it as the viewer i think is more difficult than you would think for sure but all right uh well then broadcaster nichols what do you give mandalorian on our patented Joker rating system. I give it a Jack Nicholson. Solid Jack. Not a simple Jack. A solid Jack. Outrage, here we come. (laughs) Hashtag canceled. Uh, I'm going to give The Mandalorian a Joaquin Phoenix. I think it is uh, one of the best television shows to come out in the last 20 years. And uh, that's just based off of one season. And I say that, you know, fully admitting I am a Star Wars fanboy. So you're gonna you're gonna see a little fluff on my Star Wars reviews, especially when it comes from George Lucas and it's true to the spirit of the original trilogy. And that <laughs> is the thing with this show 
that catapults it into the upper echelon for me is that it honors George Lucas's Star Wars. For sure. I think the main reason I don't give it an S is because each episode seemed to be standalone, which isn't a bad thing necessarily, but as far as like a a continuity thing and keeping it tense, it didn't seem to do it for me. Like I always felt like every episode we were kind of starting over in a way, and like the tension had been diffused and it's slowly building up every episode again until uh, until certain episodes later on. But it just I didn't care for that, and I wished that each episode was slowly building up to like you know the them running into Moth Gideon and stuff like that. Hmm. You know, like I thought, I think Moff Gideon was only introduced in like the second to last episode, right? He's only in two episodes. Yeah, he was in seven and eight. And so, yeah, I think that if you remove episode four, the bad one that neither of us like, yeah, I think that you would completely have a different outlook on that because I think the pacing was perfect in every single episode except for Sanctuary. Well, yeah, if they did, if they took Sanctuary and they would have maybe foreshadowed Moff Gideon's arrival, that would have been cool if they tied him somehow into that episode and like made you see that there was some, a big bad on the horizon instead of just being like, here's a big bad out of nowhere. And next episode, the series is over. (laughs) Yeah, no, I'm not, this is definitely not a perfect show. I don't know if a perfect show will ever exist. And we're really rating season one right now. Anyway, we're not rating the show. This show could go on to be real hot garbage in the future, or it could go on to maintain the same quality. This is a season one rank. (laughs) Yes. But as far as season one goes, this is a close to perfect show because I honestly give every single individual episode of this season a S rank except for Sanctuary, which I give like a a, a C at best. Yeah. And the ATST is probably the only reason it gets the C, not a D, <laughs> honestly. It walks but, the C right into that episode. <laughs> <laughs> but, but yeah, overall, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give it a, a solid Joaquin Phoenix. And with that...